At Triangle Veterinary Hospital, um, we have been here since 1942. It's a wonderful practice. We have incredibly compassionate and loving staff who works here. We all have animals and uh, the animals are very important. Our animals are important to us and so you're the patients that we take uh, care of are very important to us as well. Uh, for example, we do a lot of orthopedic surgeries, we do um, stem cell um, therapy, platelet-rich plasma therapy, we have an ICE, we do chemotherapy, um, and then we have, and I am, and was, and am involved in endoscopic procedures. I, I started in endoscopic in endoscopic procedures when I was in human medicine um, and uh, so we do uh, you know endoscopies, colonoscopies, rhinoscopies, uh, tracheoscopies, thoracoscopies uh, and you know so we, we have quite a bit of experience doing that. One of the huge benefits of uh, these um, either rigid or flexi fl flexible scopes is that you can actually see the tissue better through them than if you open the patient up and look at it with your eyes. You can see all the, uh, the with the angles and your ability to move these scopes around you can see um, different parts of say the liver that you couldn't see if you were doing it in a conventional way. And then you're able to um, use instruments and manipulate instruments through these um, these uh, these scopes um, and still be able to see what you're doing where in really small spaces some, sometimes your hands would obscure your view and you couldn't, you couldn't see as well so, um, and in, a, in a short amount of time. So advanced technology, th this is a very exciting time too in medicine because there are advancements, new discoveries and advancements being made every day and ultimately the patient is the one who benefits from this and so we feel compelled to stay current and, and uh, um, make available to our patients the best advancements that, that there are, um, that are possible. And really the patient benefits greatly. For example, in endoscopic um, procedures, we can do minimally invasive um, diagnostics and therapeutics, which decreases the time for recovery decreases the mortality, uh, the morbidity of associated diseases um, or, or conditions and uh, it's, you know, it really is uh, something that we feel like is minimum standard of care. What we, we also live in a community, speaking of standard of care, where, you know, there's so many major medical centers around here and we take care of so many patients where um, people work at these major major medical centers that this is um, this is what they would come to expect for themselves and they would like the, the same thing for their animals and uh, we feel like we need to offer that you know living where we do. So how has this technology impacted your patients? So um, in many ways uh, we see many uh, conditions that um, really benefit from this technology. One glaring um, condition that we see is we live in the southeastern United States where we have allergies and we see allergies every single day and and probably the most common allergic um, condition that we see are ears otitis and which requires us to evaluate the ear canal um, deeply we need to we need to be able to visualize the entire ear canal including the eardrum and if the eardrum is ruptured, sometimes into the middle ear. And it's, um, it is difficult to do with a conventional handheld otoscope, but when you have these fiber optic um, devices that will allow us to place them into the ear and see very clearly on a monitor, a large monitor, and we're able to use instruments through these, uh, through channels in these, these fiber optic instruments. We're able to clean the ears, we're able to obtain biopsies from, uh, from tissue that may look abnormal. It, it just, it, it's the difference between night and day of doing, doing it with that way versus a handheld thing. Another thing that we see 
uh, quite frequently are animals that come in sneezing or have nasal discharge, particularly cats. Um, and so being able to look into the nose of a cat or a dog with these fiber, fiber optic instruments, uh, it, it, it really should be standard of care being able to diagnose intranasal diseases. Um, and so we do quite a bit of that as well. Unfortunately, dogs and cats eat things. And um, so it's nice to be able to look down into their stomach with a fiber optic, a flexible fiber optic scope. Um, and uh, identify um, foreign bodies and usually be usually retrieve them um, through with by the by using those scopes and and the instruments through the channels uh, and not have to take the animal to surgery I mean they they come in they go home an hour later versus having to go to surgery and stay two days in the intensive care unit um, and then go home after after having gone through a major surgery, but we, you know, we also can diagnose things with, you know, uh, that normally would take, um, you know, a surgery to a major surgery to diagnose, like inflammatory, you know, chronic vomiting, chronic diarrhea dogs. We can do minimally invasive, um, full thickness intestinal and stomach biopsies. We can get. Um, liver biopsies and multi we can biopsy multiple sites um, uh, very accurately. We can see the part of the liver that's involved and, and get samples that are going to be representative of the condition that the animal has. Um, lymph nodes um, in the abdomen. So it's, you know, it just really decreases the, um, again, the morbidity and mortality associated with doing major surgeries to obtain biopsies. It's, it's phenomenally useful. Minimally invasive surgery in the veterinary arena is fairly new, but it, um, as most people know, it's standard of care in human medicine. Um, it's, you know, the keyhole surgery, if you will, is, was developed to um, be the, the most pain-free um, and less, um, have less complications than the major open type surgeries would. So we, um, here we recommend doing minimally invasive ovariectomies for sterilization of, of um, our patients because we can do in two small incisions um, what would normally take a, you know, a six or seven inch incision to open the animal up and do it. And it greatly decreases the recovery time. You, you know, you, you get a, a six month old high energy Labrador Retriever that you're going to do an ovari ovariectomy on and I can send them home that same day with minimal restrictions. They're, they can go home and play with the kids and, and their housemates that afternoon uh, versus having to be on pretty much restricted activity for seven to 14 days if we do it the conventional way. So ovariectomies are, are um, you know, there's something that we really recommend, and, and the people that have had their uh, their animals sterilized that way greatly prefer it. They they're like, boy, this is something I really didn't even know about, and this went so much better than when I, in the you know yesteryear when we had our animals um, sterilized other ways. Another way that um, our anim our patients have really benefited from um, this minimally these minimally invasive techniques are. Um, particularly in deep-chested dogs like um, greyhounds and German shepherds and rottweilers and bloodhounds and these these animals that have great big deep chests that have the um, that are overrepresented to develop torsions in their stomachs where the stomach will flip over on its long axis and so we can uh, prophylactically go in through two little small incisions and tack the stomach to the abdominal wall on the inside uh, to hopefully prevent them from ever having these life, oftentimes life-threatening or, or and sometimes deadly, um, deadly events from twi the twisting of the stomach. It's incredible. Um, and, and we used to have to open the animals up from the, from the, the top of their abdominal cavity to midway or more down to, to do that procedure and so we can do it through two tiny little incisions very quick and very easy. In a 10 year old uh, female Labrador retriever who um, 
we diagnose with uh, elevations in our liver function tests and um, we had an ultrasound done and her ultrasound looked consistent with cirrhotic liver disease which is an end stage liver disease um, which has a much different prognosis than we ultimately diagnosed her with. So, um, consideration for us um, with her and her um, advanced liver, um, ad potentially advanced liver disease state. And so we were able to diagnose, uh, we were able to do uh, laparoscopic liver biopsies of, of representative tissue in her in a very short period of time. And, and diagnosed her with a severe copper storage disease that wasn't cirrhotic at all. She did not have cirrhosis at all. And, and we've been able to treat her successfully because of that. Um, and it gave the owner a much better prognosis and the dog a much better prognosis and the outcome was, was good.